Welcome to part three in a series on what we believe as a church, as a community. And the big idea in this series is that we believe that what we believe is not just a bunch of theological propositions and doctrinal, doctrinal, however you say that, statements. We believe that what we believe is a story. A great story, a true story, and not just a story, but the story of everything. And this week's chapter in the story of everything is the story of Jesus. Now, I bet as soon as I say that, at least somebody in the room's thinking, well, I'm no Bible scholar, but I think I know this part. Because most people tend to think that the story of Jesus boils down to, you know, born in Bethlehem, taught everybody to love each other, did miracles, then died on the cross. The end. But there's so much more, so much more. That's not the end. That there's so much more to the story of Jesus. So today is all about what the story of Jesus really is. Jesus' real story, the full story. Jesus' story began long before Bethlehem. And his story continues. It just continues on well after the cross. The Bible puts it this way uh, in the Gospel of John. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it says, He was with God in the beginning. And then it goes on and says, and the Word became flesh. And it's talking about Jesus. And from Genesis, the first book of the Bible, to Revelation, the last book of the Bible, one way or another, all 66 books of the Bible, all 1,189 chapters, all 31,173 verses, not only point to Jesus, we believe it's actually all about him. At the end of the same book of the Bible that talks about Jesus being with God and being God, you know, before there was anything, before that, uh, as that part of the Bible wraps up, it concludes with this interesting comment on Jesus' story. It says that Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Hmm. So where to begin to tell the story of Jesus when his story is so chock full of important stuff that all the books in the whole world couldn't contain his story? Where do we start? Well, no idea, so let's just close in prayer, okay? Obviously, just kidding. We're, we're, we're going to do a whole series right after Easter on Jesus, and, and it's going to go a, a, a little something like this. He has more followers than Twitter has accounts. He puts salt on everything. He once sat on the real Easter Bunny's lap. His business card simply reads, I love you. Even when he's not there, he's present. He once served communion to the entire world. His handshake has the power to change your life. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't always celebrate at church, but when I do, I prefer community. Never be thirsty, my friend. Good stuff, most interesting man in the world. I, I cannot wait for that. But until then, let's go this way. See, despite the greatness and vastness and incomparable richness of the story of the most interesting man in the world, believe it or not, there's one place in scripture that tells his story in just seven verses. Look at it, this is from Philippians chapter two, a book in the New Testament. It says, Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <sighs> Seven verses. Now, Bible scholars, many in fact, refer to these seven verses as what they call a Christological hymn, meaning before this was ever written down in the Bible, it was a worship song that the first Christians sang about the story of Jesus. The whole story of Jesus in one song that's a lot shorter than 
most any song by you know Beyonce or Bruno Mars or whoever. And even though it's just seven verses, I want to boil down the story of Jesus even a little bit further into just three words. With, for, and ahead. First, let's start with with. Somebody say with. With. Thank you. Here we go. It says this. It says, Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Whew. Theologians have a fancy word for the, the, uh, this part of the story of Jesus. They call this kenosis and incarnation. Kenosis is a Greek word that literally means emptying. And it's talking about how Jesus divested himself of some of his divine attributes without ceasing to be God in order to become a human being. That's kenosis. And then incarnation is a highfalutin word that simply means that God took on flesh and became human. Kenosis, incarnation. Or in another word, let's just go with with. With. Somebody say with again. Yeah, with. I mean, why is with so important and, and so uh, appropriate and so integral to the story of Jesus? Good question. Thanks for asking. C.S. Lewis, easily one of the greatest minds of the 20th century. We quote him a lot around here. He wrote something back when the Soviet Union put the first man into space back in the 60s. At the time, Khrushchev, who was leader of the Soviet Union, at the, you know, he was this outspoken critic of all things religious, and, and he gave a speech after the first uh, cosmonaut went into space. He said this, and I quote, We have been to the heavens and God was not there. And here's what C.S. Lewis wrote in response to that. If there were a God, you would not relate to him like someone on the first story of a building would relate to someone on the second story, that if you just went upstairs, you would find him. If there is a God, you would relate to him in the way Hamlet would relate to Shakespeare. Hamlet will not find Shakespeare by going backstage or looking up in the rafters. The only way Hamlet discovers anything about Shakespeare is if Shakespeare writes himself into the play. Think about that. See, the story of Jesus is about way more than, you know, this man who taught about love and did miracles and died for our sins. Kenosis and incarnation, or more simply, with. The with of Jesus means that God has not just written about himself in a book, but he's written himself personally into the story. See, Jesus is, is with us, one of us. I mean, for eons, this is so crucial, for eons, human beings have wondered and speculated and debated what God's really like. But in the story of everything, God becomes part of the story so that he can be actually known. I mean, other religions claim that God spoke about himself through certain people, but Christianity is the only faith to claim that God became a person himself to make himself known. But, but, but the incarnation and self-emptying of Jesus, it isn't just about God making himself knowable and relatable. There, there's a big-time Europe, European philosopher uh, who lived a couple hundred years ago, Soren Kierkegaard, you know, the father of modern existentialism, according to some. And he talks about the width of Jesus this way. Suppose there was a king who loved a humble maiden. The king was like no other king. Every statesman trembled before his power. No one dared breathe a word against him, for he had the strength to crush all opponents. And yet this mighty king was melted by love for a humble maiden who lived in a poor village in his kingdom. How could he declare his love for her? In an odd sort of way, his kingliness tied his hands. If he brought her to the palace and crowned her head with jewels and clothed her body in royal robes, she would surely not resist. No one dared resist him. But would she love him? She would say she loved him, of course, but would she truly? Or would she live with him in fear, nursing a private grief for the life she had left behind? Would she be happy at his side? How could he know for sure? If he rode to her forest cottage in his royal carriage with an armed escort waving bright banners, that too would overwhelm her. He did not want a cringing subject. He wanted a lover, an equal. He wanted her to forget that he was a king and she a humble maiden, and to let shared love cross the gulf between them. For it is only in love that the unequal can be made equal. The king, 
convinced he could not elevate the maiden without crushing her freedom, resolved to descend to her. Clothed as a beggar, he approached her cottage with a worn cloak fluttering loose about him. This was not just a disguise. The king took on a totally new identity. He had renounced his throne to declare his love and to win hers. See, Kierkegaard's saying that Jesus is God taking upon himself the life of a peasant. He dressed in rags, you know, scratched out of living in the dirt, dwelt in a hovel. I mean, he didn't just take on the appearance of a servant. Became, that became his actual life, his, his burden. He became as ragged as the one he loved so that he could be with her and she could be with him forever. I mean, throughout this whole series, folks, hopefully you've been, you can recall that we've been talking about God being a community of what? Anybody? A community of grace. God is a community of grace within himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from all eternity. And, and we've talked about God working to create and recreate a community of grace in our world, out of our world. And in Jesus, that is exactly what God comes to do. He wanted us to live with him and lead us personally into this community of grace. If you want to get the story of Jesus, got to get the word with. He's with us to bring us back into the community of grace. And just as an aside here, that's what his teachings are about. He teaches about love and most often what he called the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. And, that, and that's not about after we die. That's about people following Jesus to reestablish the community of grace in the world that God loves. And the miracles of Jesus, they weren't just these, you know, ooh, look at that. These were signs of how things in the community of grace are meant to be. Signs of wholeness and, 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 and the eradication of suffering and, and the, the establishment of, of human flourishing. That's, that, that's with. Somebody say with. All right, we're doing good. Next word to sum up the story of Jesus from these seven verses in Philippians is the part of Jesus' life that most of us have heard the most about. You know, him dying on the cross. Theologians call that atonement. You know, atonement's another fancy word that represents what God did for us. But let's just go with the word for. Somebody say for. All right, and here it is in our seven verse story of Jesus. Here's the four part. It says, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. I like the way one writer talks about atonement, the, the forness of, of Jesus. It says this, that sin is man substituting himself for God, and atonement is God substituting himself for man. See, God stepped into the story of everything in Jesus. He took our place and died for us so that we could be restored to full relationship with God. Probably my favorite depiction of the atonement of the four of the story of Jesus comes from Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities. I know as soon as I say that, it's like, oh, yo, 10th grade English lit. Thank God for cliff notes, right? But it's really, it's a masterfully told story. And the part that I wanted to point out to you here today is, you know, these two main characters, Charles Darnay and, and, and Sidney. I don't know whether it's Carton or, or Carton. I'll just say Carton because it matches my accent. And they look exactly alike. They also happen to love the, the same woman, a woman named Lucy. Now, Lucy ends up choosing uh, Charles Darnay and they marry and have a child. And the setting for the whole story, as you probably know, is the French Revolution, and Charles Darnay is rounded up as part of the intellectuals who are considered an enemy of the state and imprisoned in the Bastille, and he's facing execution. Uh, so Sidney Carton and a few companions sneak into the prison, and Carton tells Darnay, you know, we look so much alike, we can just switch clothes, and they'll mistake me for you, then you can be free to live the rest of your life with the woman and the child that you love. You know, and Darnay says, you know, he would never allow him to do such a thing. So Carden does what any good friend would do. <clears throat> Bonks him on the head, knocks him out. And Charles Darnay is whisked out of the prison and, 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 and Carton takes his place on death row. But as Carton awaits his execution, another prisoner thinking he is Darnay, she starts talking to him and telling him how ter terrified she is of her impending death. And as she talks to him, she begins to realize that the switch has been made. And she asks him, are you dying for him? And he says, yes, but shh. 
Then she says, you know, I, I did not think I could face my death, but if a brave stranger like you could hold my hand, I think I could do it. Friends, I wonder if it's possible to truly, really get this, that Jesus really did take our place, that, really, that Jesus really did suffer for us and die for us. I remember the time when this hit me. It was, in my, it was the summer after my, my freshman year of college, and I was, I, was, I was praying. And it's not like I sat around praying all the time, but I was praying one night. And I know it sounds kind of out there, but... I, I had a, a mental image, uh, a vision, if you will, of Jesus you have, you know, having those spikes driven through his wrists. And it just came to me that he did that for me because of me. And man, it just blew me away. I'd always believed that sort of theologically, you know, doctrinally, but it just blew me away. And I started sobbing and it was late at night and I was, I was staying with my parents for the summer, you know, and you know, what you don't want to do when you're a, a, a mom of, a, of a, high, a college freshman is to hear him weeping aloud in the other room in the middle of the night, you know, but and I explained to her, it was just kind of a thing and, and, and she knew it was okay. But listen, if we truly understood what it meant that Jesus suffered for us, died for us, that Jesus became sin for us so that we could be forgiven of our sin and freed from its power over us and be fully reconciled with God. If we could really get that, if that could go from I know to I know, you know, that would change everything. Through the atonement of Jesus dying for us, somebody say for Thank you, thank you. God denounces and passes sentence on sin, and he does so by taking it upon himself. Folks, it's beyond amazing what God has done for us in Jesus. Jesus is God for us, dealing with the thing that separates us from the community of grace that the story of everything is about. Jesus dying for us. I mean, when I became a dad, I got a whole new perspective on, on the fourness of Jesus. I have two boys who are 22 and 19 now, but I have absolutely no trouble remembering the first time I, I took each of them into my arms. Now, now I, I'm sure it probably will never uh, come to this or be asked of me, but I know I, I'd lay down my life for my boys, either one of them, in a heartbeat. But when it comes to their lives, as much as many of you mean to me, no way would I give one of them up for any of you. <laughs> no offense, nothing personal. I do care about you. I like to think that if, I, uh, if, it, if need be, I'd, I'd, I'd give up my life for many of you listening and with us right now. But there's not a single one of you just being candid that I'd be willing to sacrifice my own son for. No way. See, at the heart of the story of everything is this mind-boggling twist in the story of everything that God willingly gives up his only son for us so that we could be restored to the community of grace. The story of Jesus tells us that God is not only with us, but God is for us. He is for us, doing for us what we can't do for ourselves so that we can be part of his family, his community. And he rose from the dead for us, paving the way for our own personal victory over death. Jesus is for us in death and resurrection. Somebody say, for. Right? So part one is with, part two is for, and part three is found in these verses, the rest of that stuff from Philippians. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When it says God exalted Jesus and in his name one day every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess that he's Lord, what's that all about? You know, one day, what's that about? It's talking about the Jesus who has something in store for us in the future, something that's ahead. Somebody say ahead. Ahead. That's our third word, ahead. I mean, everybody remembers the famous line from Arnold Schwarzenegger in Terminator, I'll be back, All right? Yeah, Schwarzenegger, I went there. But the story of Jesus is incomplete unless we grasp that he said, I'll be back. 
He didn't say, hey, you're forgiven now, so when you die, you'll come be with me in heaven. You know, see you later, skater, or something like that. He didn't say that. He said, I'm coming back. I'll be back. There, that, that's return and restoration. And it's saying that there is something very special ahead. We need to understand this. The with and the for are crucial, but they're incomplete without understanding ahead. Not realizing or grasping the fact that he's coming again to restore the community of grace this world is meant to be. Without it, that, it's like you know, going to see a movie and walking out just before the big finish. You know, or reading a great book but deciding to skip the last few pages. Jesus' return is it's, it's the pinnacle. It's the, it's, it's the, uh, the, the big moment and, and the big finish in the story of everything. And I know it's hard to talk about this whole thing of Jesus coming again because unfortunately some folks who are, you know, overly interested in my opinion in, in when this one day is, you know, they get all caught up in trying to predict the exact time and date, you know, and, and others have used, you know, Jesus coming back as, you know, as kind of a scare tactic to get people to come Christians. And, that, and that's not only messed up, that misses the point of ahead. I mean, think for a moment how tough it is for us to watch the evening news and hear about all the violence and suffering in the world. You know, civil war in Syria, genocide here, famine and poverty there. I mean, have you ever wondered when God's going to do something about all that? Have you? In Matthew 19, 28, precious verse, Jesus spoke of his return. And he says this, he says, I tell you the truth. At the renewal of all things, the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. See those words, the renewal of all things? His mission was to renew the earth. No more natural disasters. Renew economic systems. No more exploitation of the poor by the wealthy and powerful. Renew political systems. No more war. Renew social systems. You know, no more hatred among the races and ethnicities. Re and renew most of all the human heart. No more sin and no more pain. Best-selling author Tim Keller uh, puts it this way. He says, when Jesus spoke these words, uh, it was saying this, it was a radically new concept. Jesus insisted that his return will be with such power that the very material world and universe will be purged of all decay and brokenness. All will be healed. See, I think for most of my life, I don't know about you, but I, I miss this aspect of Jesus' story. I mean, it was like Jesus' story was just about me and my you know, salvation. And though I can hold on to that promise, and, and I do, let's not forget that the story of everything is not the story of me. It includes me, but it's not the story of me. It's, it, it, it's, it, it, it's the story of everything. I mean, Jesus came and set the stage for restoration, and, and that's ahead, and he will certainly come again to restore all things to the way they were originally intended to be. That's what's ahead. And the implications of this are huge. Keller goes on to say, I, I love this. Don't, somebody needs this. Christians then are the true revolutionaries who work for justice and truth and we labor in expectation of a perfect world in which he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Man, I love that. We're the true revolutionaries. Gosh, I hope we can get that in the spirit that it's meant. See, God's with us and God's for us, but there's something ahead of us. And in the meantime, we work to partner with God for the sake of others, looking ahead to the final restoration of all things in the community of grace, otherwise known as the new heaven and the new earth. I mean, every time we feed the hungry, we partner with God for what's ahead. Every time we reconcile people and races, we partner with God for what's ahead. Every time we as a church help bring a marriage back together, connect the lonely to community, give us student hope for their future, we partner with God for what's ahead. And what's ahead is the restoration, the renewal of all things. Being a Christ follower is becoming part of where Jesus is leading the world where he's leading the world to in his love and sacrifice and suffering, to this restorative ahead. Somebody say ahead. Make no mistake about it, friends. At some point in the future, ahead of us, Jesus will come again and he will finish the work that he began and continues to do through us. Christ followers who know the story of everything become true revolutionaries who value everything that God made and work for its healing and freedom. Because Jesus is not just with and Jesus is not just for. Jesus is ahead. That's the story of Jesus. 
with four and a head. Question is, for right now, how are you going to respond to the withness, the foreness, the aheadness of Jesus? How are you going to commit yourself to the Jesus who came to be with you? How, how will you embrace what Jesus has done for you? How will you join Jesus in working for what's ahead? In three weeks, we have a special opportunity. We're going to have a uh, a big old uh, church-wide baptism service to give everybody the opportunity who hasn't made it yet to make a public commitment to follow Jesus if they haven't already done so. In three weeks, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary as a particular local church. And, and what better way to celebrate it than to think about 25 years of helping people find their way back to God, find their way back to the community of grace. Would you choose to follow Jesus right now? Would you choose to make that commitment public in three weeks? The story of Jesus is a story that changes everything with four and ahead.